up on with this show so far, money is not like the end all be all. In fact, we're not much into like spending all of our time thinking about or trying to make money. We'd much rather be doing something else like what we're passionate about, what we love doing, what we'd love to contribute to the world. So we've tried to find the simplest, almost minimalistic ways to set up our money systems so that they can run efficiently. And so we can like do what we really love rather than like sit there and counter coins or something like that, cut coupons, you know, think about how to make or keep money, right? We've taken some cues from the ultra wealthy. Um, they seem to have some things figured out maybe, but also like thought about the average person who's doing things right um, as well and what is working for them. Kind of this idea like, do we think Warren Buffett got to where he is by accident? No, he did things intentionally. Do we think the average person is going to be able to manage their money successfully by accident? No, we take control. We act intentionally, right? But taking control, acting intentionally does not mean that money has to eat up our time and energy too, right? So this week, we're going to dig into five laws of money that are pretty easy to understand. They're pretty quick to set up and to manage over time, and they can totally transform the next 30 plus years of your life. They might even be all that you need to reach financial independence. Pretty big idea there. But these laws aren't something I've made up. They've actually come from a book first published in 1926, and it has all the male chauvinism you might expect. But this is my attempt to bring it into almost 100 years later, when so much has changed and yet so much remains the same. The book is called The Richest Man in Babylon. This is what it looks like. It's written by George S. Clayson. And the current rendition, if George were writing in 2020, might be the wealthiest woman in the world. And this is my take on how his five laws would apply today. So welcome to the Fife Movement. I'm your host, Amanda Neely. This is the only movement that helps our generation create our unique feminine and entrepreneurial path to financial independence. I wanna ask you a question today and be honest with yourself. Do you have something that you save, even if it's somewhat illogical? Like if that thing were big enough or you were given enough time, you'd fill your house with it and you'd totally be labeled a hoarder. Do you have a thing like that? I know I do. My thing is information. I love books and papers and digital files and I have them saved for years and years. I say all the time, but you never know when I might need it. And I do that to justify my behavior, but some of it I know is just totally illogical. Now, I try to be a minimalist in all areas, so I've tried to grow in this area as well. When we moved earlier this year, I used that as an opportunity to minimize my paper. I recycled so much paper before we moved. And I'm a little scared though, because I'm planning to live in the same place for a long time, how much I'm gonna accumulate here. Now, um, my husband, Brandon, his thing that he saves are gifts. If someone gives him a gift, even if he never uses it, he'll keep it for like a really, really long time. I guess he feels weird giving away something that someone gave him. To me, I think, well, if you're not going to use it, let someone else use it that could benefit from it right? Yet we still have a wedding gift or two that we haven't used and we've been married a long time. <laughs> now with saving like stuff, material objects, everyone knows they need to find their unique balance between only keeping the things that have value or that they find useful and like becoming a hoarder in the extreme. But what about your money? I mean, how much is the right to save? Could you ever be a hoarder and save too much? Could you be too minimalistic and save too little? Should you wait until you're out of debt to save? There's all kinds of questions when people start thinking about saving money. Now, the time-tested wisdom is the first law of money. Here we go. Money comes joyfully and in increasing quantity to any person whosoever will put by not less than one-tenth of her earnings 
to create an estate for her future and that of her family and favorite charities. One tenth with no qualifications, one tenth set aside for the long-term future for yourself, your family, and your legacy. Money comes joyfully to the person that will set aside one tenth. Now, the biggest objection I hear to saving a tenth is this. I'll start when. Like, I can't start now, but I will start when I've paid off debt. I'll start when I'm making more money. I'll start when I've got my financial life in order and mastered budgeting or, you know, something like that. And yet, from my experience, I think following this law, starting to set aside a tenth, helps you get your financial life in order. It can help you actually increase your income. It might even help you get out and, and more importantly, stay out of debt. Think about it. If you have a real human being creditor, right? Not a credit card or a student loan company, but let's pretend you owe money to another individual, a human being, and you can connect on that human to human level. So you go to that person and you say, I still plan to keep paying you back, but I'm also going to set aside one tenth of my income for my future as well. What do you think that person would say to you? Do they think, do you think they'd say, no, you need to pay me that tenth too, right? I think they would say something like, great, I'll get my money back. I know you're going to pay me and you'll do that diligently, but I'm also get, it's also going to make sure that you never have to come begging to borrow money from me again because you're going to create this nest egg for yourself for times of need or for times of opportunity. Now, a credit card company might want to keep you in debt to them so they keep making your interest payments and maybe even some fees if you pay late every once in a while. But you can't only think about what's best for the short term, you know, getting out of debt as quickly as possible, just saving that little bit of interest um, by paying off your debt sooner. I think we need to think more about the long term and what a delaying of your savings can cost you in terms of the growth of that money that you need for your future, for your family, for your legacy, um, and how it can be there for you in times of need or in times of opportunity in a way that debt can't be there for you, right? So let me wrap up today with an example. Let's make this actually like practical. Practical. Let's say you make $30,000 per year. And if you start saving a 10th, which is 3,000 per year today, and let's say you just get 1% compound growth, not, not a huge amount, right? But you continue saving that $3,000 for 30 years. You'd have $105,000 at the end of 30 years. Pretty good. But if you wait five years and start in five years um, and then save for 25 years, you're only going to have $85,000. That's a $20,000 difference because you waited five years. Think about what debt you're paying. Do you think you're going to save $20,000 by paying off that debt more quickly over the next five years and then starting to save? Or do you think that uh, if you started saving and continued to pay on your debt besides that saving, that the difference would be bigger in 25, 30 years, right? And of course, that's just one example. That difference, that $20,000 difference can get even bigger the longer you wait, right? Like let's say instead of five years, you wait 10 years because it's going to take you that longer, long to get out of debt. Or let's say um, the if you've got 35 years or 40 years to save instead of just 20 years, right? That difference is just going to get bigger. Or let's say instead of 30,000, you make 80,000 or your income continues to increase. So you're able to save more. That 10th increases as your income increases. That's just going to widen that gap as well. And so you got to think about those kind of things when you're thinking about, do I start saving today or should I wait until X, Y, or Z happens? Okay, now let me conclude with this question. What would it take to start saving at least 1% of your income first before you pay off any other bills? Just to start building that habit, building that saving muscle. And then what would it take to grow that 1% to 10%? 
you can start today figuring that out. Start asking yourself what, what's it going to take? And more importantly, start doing it. The next time you get paid, start shifting to savings. Or if you're already shifting, start thinking about how you can shift more to a savings vehicle. Then stay tuned for laws two through five, where we'll discuss what to do with this 10th to make sure it's there for you when you need it. And it's going to be efficient and effective for you over the next 25, 30 years. Okay. So thanks for joining me today and connecting with the Fife Movement. As you go about your day, remember wealth is coming your way. Your quest is to prepare for using it well. For more tips on how to prepare, be sure to subscribe. And to connect with the community, visit fifemovement.com. And a little heads up, when you go to fifemovement.com, I've got a gift for you there with what I would tell you if all we had was a chance to grab one cup of coffee together. I put it all into this gift. And if the gift of this episode today has helped you, please pay that gift forward by sharing this content with a friend. My gratitude in advance. To help this video be seen by more people, please hit the like button and we invite your comments in the or your feedback in the comments too.